Tonight, we're here in Fort Valley, Georgia, in the historic district of Fort Valley. I would like to invite you into the Villa Capriccio with us. Tonight, we will have a full access pass into the paranormal. We will be going over our history of this location, the paranormal equipment in which we use during paranormal investigations, and we'll also be going through our findings from the investigation that we had here on August the 4th. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on how we do an investigation. Um, the first thing that we do, let me step out of the way so you guys can see. The first thing we kind of do is we go into a place and we interview and see who the people are. And I know there's a couple of reasons we do that. Number one, we have to make sure, me and Chris are usually the ones that go, we have to make sure it's safe for our team to come in and investigate. Um, as bad as it sounds, we don't want to go into a house where we could be in danger, not from anything paranormal, but literally living. Um, after that, we do our investigations, and then we come back, and we show our client what we have found, um, if we find anything at all. Our paranormal equipment, we have it all kind of laid out. I hope some of you have taken a look um, throughout the night, possibly, and some of you that get picked will get to go with us either to the third floor basement and then we'll swap again. So all of us will be on the third floor basement that get picked from the raffle. Um, this is part of our equipment. I'll just kind of give a brief overview. Um, this is the part of the DVR system. And we hook these up. These are IR cameras. Um, they only see in the IR spectrum though. It's not a complete visual spectrum. So sometimes an investor will be like, well, I saw that. But it isn't necessarily captured on camera, and that's just because this is only in the infrared visual spectrum. Um, this is one camera out of eight, and then it has a big box, and you can see why we wouldn't bring the whole thing. But it's just a quick little demonstration. Then we have a laser grid. These laser grids, um, you'll hear me reference new school and old school. You have old school paranormal investigating, which is like 1970-ish, and they, they can only do what they had presently available to them. And we have new school. So if I say new school, it's kind of like the current age and then old school is kind of what my parents or their parents would have had to have used, um, even though it wasn't talked about as much. This laser grid is part of the new school. If you take a look, I could do both. They're in different colors, I hope. This one is not as visible because it's not dark. We'll just do the green. Um, you can turn the dial and this is useful for like, and for instance, when we went to Old South Pittsburgh Hospital in Tennessee, down dark, narrow halls, we'd say, oh, we think we see shadow play or we'd see things moving. Well, the great way, this is a great way to tell because when it's dark and all you have are these lights, you can see figures if they're moving in and out within the laser grid. Um, we have different fittings. You can do them, you know, really big, really small. The narrower, the better for some. It just depends on your situation. Um, the next piece of advice is just device. It's just a regular digital camera. Um, cameras are part of the old school. Um, the old time paranormal investigators used to have you know those huge cameras. Now we just have the digital cameras. Um, cameras are great because sometimes you can get digital camera evidence. Um, I would say if you classify the frequency of the evidence that you got, number one, easy to get is electronic, electronic voice phenomenon, which is EVPs, um, with a recorder. Number two would be photographs, and the third, which is the hardest to capture, is video evidence. Um, so it's not something we do all the, all the time. Um, then we just have our walkie-talkies, um, just to keep in contact with each other. And when, in our group, it's really important that we're very personable with each other. You do have larger groups that they don't know each other. I personally was against that. I'd like to know who I was walking around in the dark with, you know? And um, so when I founded this group, that was one of the things I wanted to be able to know who I was working with and really get along with them and not want to cut their throats in the dark and they're not, they're not cut my throat in the dark. Um, the next thing 
is a digital voice recorder. <clears throat> These capture EVPs, which is electronic voice phenomenon, or even disembodied voices that we can hear, which we actually capture some disembodied voices. This can be hooked up to your, like, your digital recorder, and it can be a little bit more sensitive, and it can help you pick up more than just the regular mic on the recorder. The next thing, and I know you're probably going to think, how many flashlights could you possibly need? But they're a great tool for investigating. Um, the first ones, these are the ones we wear and we use when we're not wanting to be in the dark. And we use them on the red setting. And the reason it's on the red setting is because in our IR lights, when we have our um, system on and we're recording, it will literally kill the lights if you put the white light into it. So the red light helps to amplify it. It helps to not damage the system. But then you have your other settings as well. Um, these lights, these are tap lights. You can just easily touch the top, and it turns on, and, touch, and it turns off. We use this for provocation to try to get a response from anything that might be within an area. Then we can record it or document it as paranormal evidence. That's the biggest thing we want is evidence, proof that this is what's happening and we can solidify that. Um, the other piece of equipment is just the regular handy cam. And this one has the night vision already put into it, which is the IR. But then we also hook up IR illuminators. And that's just so rooms are more distinct and things are more defined. This is great only also for audio. We can capture things that EVPs once again. And we can capture object manipulation if the light's turning on and off things of that nature. Then we move on to our K2s. Now the thing with K2s and the next few pieces of equipment I'm going to show you is that it bases itself off the electromagnetic field. And the theory behind it is that magnetism has to do with spirits either manifesting themselves or they can use that energy to manifest themselves or to make things occur. Um, this right here is all measured in milligauss. This one goes up fairly high. This house itself has a lot of the original fixtures. So old appliances and old homes automatically can give this out. Um, you can ask Tim when we first came in, we came through and figured out what, what already gave off a magnetic field. So we could run thorough experiments without having to <laughs> without having to um, be, have anything misrepresented. Um, but the K2 can be used for communication. If a spirit comes up, you can know you're in the presence of a spirit. They can light certain lights up. I have seen that occur. Um, you could say light it to the orange light, and it'll do that. You can ask for it to hold three seconds, things of that nature. The next piece of equipment is within the EMF field again. This is a gauze meter, and this is one of my favorite because it makes noise and you don't always get to be somewhere you can't be everywhere as a paranormal investigator so what i can do is i could leave this upstairs and i can come downstairs and be investigating and i if i leave it somewhere and then it goes off i know that something's going on that there's some kind of interruption in the magnetic field and i can know that i need to go to it if you hit the buttons on the side it goes to the background emf which the background EMF is anything from 1.0 below. The background EMF at Tim's is kind of high. Sorry, Tim. Um, but it's any, everything below 1. So it's nothing dangerous. But some people who are sensitive to it could get certain feelings. Um, <coughs> we were told a claim when we first arrived that a lot of people, there's a back stairway going up to the fourth floor, that a lot of people felt kind of, freaked out and didn't want to go up it. Well, when we took our equipment up there, the EMF readings in that hallway itself are through the roof. Wow. And um, so it's not necessarily something paranormal on that stairway. It's just those people are a little bit more sensitive to the EMF and um, that they can pull that feeling. They feel that high field there. Um, Lex is on our team and she's sensitive to it. She actually, we were on an investigation and a room that was right next to a big power transformer. The readings were off our charts. And she walks in and she just about, you know, loses it all over the floor. 
Um, it can make you nauseous. It can make you feel paranoid. It can make you feel like someone's watching you. It, 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 if you're sensitive to it, you can, you can feel it. I know that sounds silly for those of us who are not, but there are some people that are very sensitive to high levels of electromagnetism. Um, the next one is just the regular EMF detector. This one does TESTA, which is electrical. I'm sure you guys, men, know that. And then you have the milligoss again. Same thing, it just gives you numeric readings in EMF. This gives you the regular. Right now we're at about a 13.3. Most of Tim's light switches throughout the house are that way, but it's just because they're originals. Um, but it's also good for us to know if we're investigating, and I'm standing right here, and look like this, and I'm like, wow, I'm getting these readings. Well, hello. You know, <laughs> there's this big source of electromagnetic energy behind me. Um, the next piece of equipment, this is from the new, new school. Um, <laughs> these are EMF pumps. They actually emit electromagnetic energy. With these, spirits can draw off of this energy and they can use it to um, manifest themselves or do things so we can set these on the floor and provide energy for them. Like I said, this piece of equipment makes the noise when it's in the present and as you see, it emits the field by itself. So we can pretty much create a magnetic field wherever we go, which is really helpful. Um, then we have the SP7 box or the spirit box or Frank's box. There's a lot of names sometimes in the paranormal field. <laughs> Um, but Frank is the one guy who invented it, so I call it Frank's box because I think he deserves the credit. But basically what it does is it scans through radio frequencies. You can do FM or you can do AM. And you can sweep in reverse, which is how we like to sweep backwards. The theory is that when the voice comes over the SB7, that is the spirit's voice. Because I've, I'm about fixing to turn on, but it's really loud. And you'll hear it's like, da, 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 like there's no audible words at all. But when the voice comes through over those audible frequencies, then that's something that we consider to be paranormal. And I'm going to plug this up to demonstrate. So it's kind of loud. I'm sorry. I hope nobody minds. All right. All right. So we're switching in reverse. And as you hear, it's just like, and since we're going backwards, there should be no audible frequency whatsoever. And you will hear like, blah, 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 blah. but when we get voices that come over that, that extend a little, da, 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 da. a lot of you might have seen these, you know, at work or, yeah. And we use it, we go through first of all to get a baseline reading to make sure, okay, right now it's 71 degrees in here, almost 72. And then if somebody says, oh, I'm feeling a cold spot, we can document it. But I will caution you that if you ever see a picture and someone's standing like out of the Indian Mounds and making our park and they're shooting it and they're like videotaping it and they're like, oh, look at all these off the wall readings. A uh, duh, it's not hitting anything. <laughs> if it doesn't hit something that it can bounce back at, it's not gonna give you a consistent reading. So a lot of, I've seen this on quite a few paranormal groups pages that are not you know, completely professional. And they'll be like outside of the park or the Indian Mounds or the Edward Mounds in Atlanta and they'll be like, look at all these crazy readings and they're videotaping it and they're going, oh man, look, it's not hitting anything. <laughs> so it doesn't count. It has to be able, glass and in reflective things can kind of sometimes give you the same kind of thing, um, same kind of fluctuations that are not consistent. So the best thing to do is to hit it off a wall. You can turn on the laser, know exactly where you're hitting it at and get the exact temperature. The next piece of equipment, these are all motion detectors. Um, this one's kind of cool because like we set one of these up on the third floor while we were <laughs> investigating in other areas of the house and if something moved in front of it or something moved in the area, this was back at our base camp outside and it would ding and let us know. So we like it's, it's all about being there without necessarily always having to be there with the paranormal because it's about the right time and being there at the right time and the right moment. And you don't always get that. You try. Um, the next detector is the motion detector as well. This, if something goes in front of it, it just simply lights up. And it's good to use, like, if we're investigating in here, we can set it in there. And we're in the pitch black dark. And if something walked by Tim's TV, that's not supposed to be there because we have the room, we have the whole house isolated and secured. 
it would light up and we'd be able to see the light and be like, hey, there's something going on in there. Um, and next, we're going to kind of give them the history of the villa. And we all know this place is absolutely beautiful. But why is history important? And some people are like, okay, paranormal is cool, and history has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with it. The people who lived here, they're tied here. They're, they're in these walls. Their memories are here. That is such a big part of what a location is. It, you can move a house, and they're still here attached to the spot. And so that is why history is so important. Um, to get history research, this place is actually really great because we could contact the Evans um, family. Um, but a lot of times we have to go into libraries, dig in archives, find tax records, go through newspapers. And one of the biggest helps, um, Emily's mom actually sat down with us and gave us a little bit of 411 about the location. Um, but one of the biggest helps is what people remember. Um, it helps, it gives us a place to start. When you go into a place in the pitch black dark, that makes for a lot of sitting at a library and going through records and archives. Um, and we use this history not to necessarily say, okay, this is the person that's here because we don't know unless they tell us, but we use it to try to provoke if to see if it is the person that's here, to make a connection, to talk about their time, to talk about their error, to talk about the things that they might have found interesting. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn over to the lovely and tantalizing and amazingly beautiful Lex <clears throat> and she's going to tell you about the history of hey the everybody villa. my name is Lex um, I'm going to share with you um, some of the fascinating and informative information and history that we learned on the Villa Capriccio um, this property was previously used as the Grady Institute which was the first all-white school in the Fort Valley um, area um, the Villa Capriccio which was also known as the Evan Cantrell house was built in 1916 um, it's an Italian Renaissance style. It was built by Mr. A Mr. Albert James Evans, who was also known as A.J. Evans. He was a very successful businessman, um, a community leader, and a farmer in the area. Mr. Evans was very, very powerful to the point where he earned the nickname the Peach King for controlling the prices of the peaches on the eastern seaboard. Mr. Evans lived in this house with his wife and their five children. Um, they actually had seven children, but two died at a very young age. Um, Mrs. Evans died in the 1930s, um, but A.J. Evans had continued to live in this home until his death in 1949. He is buried in the Fort Valley City Cemetery um, with the acknowledgement over his headstone as pioneer peach grower. The adult son of Mr. Evans, he continued to live in the home with his family until he passed and then the, the house was inherited by his son Charles, who is still a successful farmer in the Peach County area. Charles loved the house but couldn't physically move it to the country where he wanted to live the most. Um, so he donated, to, donated the church to the Baptist, I'm sorry, donated the, it to the Baptist Church in Fort Valley. Um, the church owned the home for almost a year and at that time Norman and Sarah Lane Cantrell purchased the home and they turned it into a bed and breakfast which they ran for many years. It was later owned by Greg and Marty Comer who attempted to run a bed and breakfast um, for a short while also. After which the current owner, Tim, purchased the home and has continued to run it as a bed and breakfast. Tonight I invite you to not only focus on the massive beauty of this home, but to consider the people who established their lives and the full, all the memories that are within, the, within these stories. Why are you still here? Is there something you need? <laughs> 